Welcome to Board Games Untoast, all of you lovely people. I am once again back talking about the latest edition of Warcry, and I am once again back talking about Warbands. Today, I thought I would take a bit of a break from covering the bespoke boxed Warbands and instead have a perilous gander at the Compendium. More specifically, the Age of Sigma Factions. Today, I am looking at the spooky ghosts, the Nighthaunt. Who are these guys? Where do they come from? Why are they here? To answer all those questions, we need to dust off a little bit of story time, which means that you need to grab yourself a hot chocolate and get cosy under your Games Workshop approved blanket. The Nighthaunt are creatures so ethereal, so unnatural that their deathly visage strikes fear into even the most stalwart of knights. They are the unliving embodiment of stories told to children to make them behave. The clawing shadow that creeps across the room, nightmare made manifest. Phantoms donned in ghastly robes, brandishing spectral blades that freeze the blood in your veins. The night haunt rend your soul and send it wailing into the loving arms of Nagash, the god of the dead. The Nighthaunt are some of the most striking models in all of Age of Sigma, and their inclusion in Warcry doesn't diminish their outstanding visual style. Whilst they do fall into the trap of being a faction that is just spooky ghosts in robes, and that's about it, it's impossible to deny that it's a visual that never really gets old. Being a compendium faction ported over from Age of Sigma, Nighthaunt have a vast selection of models to choose from, with a whopping 13 or so leaders and 10 units. This can be overwhelming at first, but we're going to go through them all in this video and break them down. I'm also going to change things up and try something new by combining abilities and stats into one thing. This should hopefully help with the flow of the video and make things go a little bit smoother. After all, why not give all the information in one go? But before that, we are going to look at their reactions separately, since every model in this faction has access to it. It is called Flickering Form. A fighter can make this reaction when an enemy fighter finishes a move action within three inches of them. Note the distance between this fighter and the enemy fighter that made that move action. Remove this fighter from the battlefield and set this fighter up on a platform or the battlefield floor no further from the enemy fighter that made that move action. So flickering form is very interesting as a reaction that can be used in a number of ways. Whilst you can't move further away from your enemies, you can move around them in a circle and even get closer to them. What does this mean in reality? Well, in a fringe instance, when you want to make space for other allies to get into combat, you can flickering form the blocking model to make that space. This can also be used to make it easier to surround an enemy and make their escape impossible. Its biggest use, in my opinion, is using it to travel up the board easier. If an enemy were to, for example, end their movement three inches away from you so they could use their three inch flail to hit you, you could use flickering form to get to the other side of them staying three inches away and functionally moving six to seven inches, maybe even more depending on the enemy's base size. This is a very sneaky way of getting to objectives, getting behind enemy lines and generally giving you mobility options. Even if you use this against an enemy who stopped one inch away from you, you will still get to move around three to four inches which is better than a disengage on multiple levels. Overall, this reaction is exactly what I said at the start. Interesting. I don't think you will use this all the time, but that is the way of all reactions. It's solid and can mess with your opponent in fun and unique ways. Now we have all of that out of the way, we can look at our leaders starting with the Knight of Shrouds. So the Knight of Shrouds comes in two variants, one on horseback, and one on foot, magic cape, we'll say foot for now. So offensively, these guys are identical. We're talking range one, attack four, strength four, two, four damage. This is a fairly respectable attack profile 
and rolling in at around 5 to 6 damage per action. This means you're probably going to cut down any chaff that gets in your way, providing that you get to attack twice, and even some of the tougher Rune 12 models are at risk of being taken out with the help of the likes of Onslaught. This damage profile also comes into its own when you consider the Knight of Shroud's unique ability, Stolen Hours. This allows the Knight of Shrouds to heal the damage dealt for activation. Again, you are looking at healing around 5 damage per attack action, providing you're hitting on a 4+. This is a very solid heal, especially if you get to swing twice. And considering this is on a double, it's a very nice bump in survivability. And adding to this even more, the faction-wide double Aura of Dread allows you to sap an enemy's strength characteristic within ability dice range. This ability is very strong and can drastically decrease an enemy's ability to harm your units. This can be used by everyone in your faction, so the Knight of Shards isn't needed to run it, it's just nice to have another unit that can throw this debuff around, and again, it's a double, making it wonderfully spammable. Then we get into the defensive stats, and the Knight of Shrouds continues to impress, or more accurately, it doesn't really disappoint. On foot, we're looking at movement 6, toughness 4, and 20 wounds, and a price tag of 190 points. Mounted, that price jumps to 270, but you also gain plus 8 wounds and plus 4 to your movement. Not only that, but you retain the fly rune mark, which we won't mention from now on, but do know that all Night Haunt rock fly, giving them incredible freedom and mobility. Of the two, I don't think this steed is worth it. There's a better units that can move just as fast for cheaper. The bump in wounds is nice, but for 270 points, it's very expensive for a model that isn't anywhere near as good as comparable models in combat. On foot, you're actually paying an alright price for this profile, and you could absolutely do worse than the Knight of Shrouds. It is overshadowed by other units in this faction, but it never stops being a solid, safe option to lead your warband. Oh, and before we move on, there is one more ability available to the Knight of Shrouds, and that is the Spectral Summoning ability, which allows you to summon a dead fighter back to the battlefield. This is a triple, and as you will soon find out, this can be used to great effect by certain models. The Knight of Shrouds is actually one such model, as whilst all heroes can use this ability, the Knight of Shrouds is a bit sturdier than most, allowing him to take some hits and summon without risk of being taken out beforehand. Next up, we have the Guardian of Souls. If the Knight of Shrouds was your Jack of All Trades, survivable Demi Bruiser, the Guardian of Souls is your backline support piece. Coming in at 175 points, you get an identical defensive profile to the Knight of Shrouds, minus the powerful self-heal. What you get instead is a rather expensive, but very effective, triple in the form of Unholy Light. This ability heals D3 damage to all allies within 6 inches. The heal itself is fairly strong and can help top up your units and keep them swinging that extra bit longer. The biggest strength though is the range. 6 inches is nothing to scoff at in Warcry and this can cover a lot of allies allowing your guardian the souls to well guard your souls. It's a very nice ability that unfortunately costs a little bit too much. As we will soon see, Night Haunt are very triple heavy and Unholy Light is easy to forget when more impactful abilities exist in that ability pool. But what else does the Guardian of Souls bring to the table? Well, this guy brings a range attack and a bit of a slap attack. Of the two, the range attack is far better and comes out at dealing about two times the damage against all targets on average. This still isn't much damage, and it is a bit of a downgrade from the Knight of Shrouds, range be damned. You could certainly do worse than the Guardian of Souls, but it does feel like it fills a role that isn't really required. A role that costs too many resources to shoehorn in, if that makes sense. Now, next up, we have the Cruel Ghast Cruciator. And honestly, this guy's a bit of an odd duck, and one that at a glance doesn't look too bad. It's another ranged unit, only this time you have no unique abilities, and are stuck with the standard Aura of Dread and Spectral Summons. In exchange, you get a rather impressive looking range attack with range 10, attacks 4, strength 4, 
one for damage. Realistically though, you aren't doing that much more damage than the Guardian of Souls, uh, to the point that it's really negligible. Not only that, the Cruel Ghast loses all of the utility provided by the Guardian since it has no unique abilities and is more expensive coming in at 30 points more or 205 points in total. He's a bit underwhelming all things considered. And this leads into yet another ranged hero, only this time we have a truly budget friendly hero that is surprisingly tempting to take if you just want a cheap and cheery leader to lead your misfits in the battle. And of course we're talking about the Craven Huntmaster. Defensively this guy is fine for his points cost. 135 points for movement 6, toughness 4 and 15 wounds. This won't survive much of a beating, but it should be able to survive a few pot shots before being floored. Offensively, we have two profiles, one being a really bad melee attack, and then one being a slightly better ranged attack. Don't go in thinking that this guy will deal much damage though, his damage per action is awful, barely averaging over one damage. On the plus side, you do gain access to the Aura of Dread and Spectral Summons, like all heroes, giving you some utility and a cheap way to resurrect the dead, which certainly has its merits. I don't think you will see much play of this guy, but they are definitely cheap enough to be tempting in the right list. Maybe. Maybe. Moving away from the, the ranged heroes, we now have the Spirit Torment, and the Spirit Torment is really weird. 195 points gets you your standard movement 6, toughness 4, and you also get 25 wounds, which is quite nice. Offensive, you get range 2, attacks 2, strength 5, and 3-5 damage profile. Those damage numbers and strength look very, very nice, but they are also very, very deceptive. The Spirit Torment is worse offensively than the Knight of Shrouds, and the Knight of Shrouds has the added benefit of being cheaper, and having a very powerful and very reliable self-sustain. Sure, the Knight of Shards has five less wounds, but that doesn't really matter when in every other way the Spirit Torment falls flat. Now this thing does have its own unique ability called Captured Soul Energy, but here's the kicker, it's a quad. This makes it really unreliable, even if the effect is quite nice. This, like the Guardian of Souls, is an AOE heal although this time you are healing flat ability dice damage in a 6 inch aura, not d3 heal. The catch here, well, all of the catches are pretty plain to see. It's too expensive to use. Quads are rare and this quad isn't that great and you need a good quad for it to work. Then on top of all of that, you still need to actually kill an enemy for the quad to be activated and the spirit torment really struggles in that regard. Honestly, give this one a miss. If you want a healer, go Guardian of Souls. And if you want a tanky bruiser, go Knight of Shrouds. This half measure won't satisfy anyone. And here's the thing. The Knight of Shrouds and the Guardian of Souls are both okay. But they're not great in and of themselves either. And the Spirit Torment doesn't compare favorably to them. So it, when compared to the rest of the list, as we're going to go into soon, the Spirit Torment really has no place. But now we get to something quite exciting, and that is the Dreadblade Harrow. Man, this, this, this is really where things get good. I love the Knight of Shrouds, because I like, you know, tanky self-healing paladin knight things that are dead. But this guy, I take far more often. This guy, I would take all the time. Right off the bat, we are looking at a rich price point of 235 points which is 45 points more than the Knight of Shrouds. But for that bump in price, you get plus four movement and plus five wounds. You also have an identical attack profile, making you decent in combat, if a little bit overpriced for that profile at this points range. That movement 10 is where it's all at though, and it really lets the Dreadblade get around the battlefield and do work, mainly do objectives. Very few enemies can catch the Dreadblade, and the ones that do, not all of them can compete with his damage output or even have a chance of killing it. Simply put, 
it's very hard to stop the Dreadblade and this is made even more effective thanks to his unique ability, Phantasmal Discorporation. This is a board-wide teleport with some very light restrictions on when you can use it and where you can appear. Basically, the Dreadblade is an objective beast able to take treasures, claim points, and generally be a pain in the butt. You can teleport onto or near an objective of some kind, claim it, pick it up, and do whatever you want with it, and then move 20 inches with fly to escape. It's crazy mobile in an already impressively mobile faction. I love this guy for his utility alone. Remember, he still has access to summoning and the aura of dread. This guy is a jack of all trades plus, and I kid you not, I could see people running two, maybe even three of these guys in their lists. Very strong. Now, taking a bit of a step back from the Dreadblade Harrow, we have the Lord Executioner. Did you want a Spirit of Torment, but with no added utility, and a price point that is so close to its competitors that you would never, ever consider taking it? Well, does Nighthaunt have a redundant hero for you in the Lord Executioner? With no unique abilities, a negligibly better attack profile than the Spirit of Torment, and only 15 points off a superior night of shrouds, I simply don't see the point in this model. It has nothing going for it. There are cheaper heroes you can take as filler characters, and it doesn't compare well against these slightly more expensive characters. He's frankly just a waste. I would give a hard, hard skip here. But nothing compares to the Scripta Mortis. The Scripta Mortis is bad. Moving on. Okay, okay, okay. I'll explain why briefly. Stats-wise, this thing just sucks. It's decently tanky for its price, which is the only good thing here. Offensively, it's worthless. It's only slightly cheaper than the Guardian of Souls. It has no range attack, and its unique ability is terrible. Sentence to Eternal Torment asks you to spend a valuable triple to roll the dice. If you roll equal to or lower than the current battle round, deal 6 damage to one thing. It has infinite range and just requires line of sight, but come on, this ability is painfully unreliable the entire game, and it doesn't come close to making this wet noodle worth taking. Another waste of ink, forget this guy exists, he is painfully, painfully bad. After two back-to-back -back dumpster fires, we have something that's actually quite good, I quite like this one, it is the Tomb Banshee. I actually really like this hero when compared to many of the heroes we've looked at so far. Does it make it good? Kind of. Does it make it interesting? Definitely. Uh, I think this is a very interesting character that I've ran a couple of times and had some decent success with. For 175 points, you get a fairly solid body, although one that is noticeably squishier than most we've covered so far. Looking at movement 6, toughness 4, and 18 wounds, Offensively, however, the Tomb Banshee is deceptively effective. It has two profiles, one being range 10, attack 2, strength 4, 2, 5 damage, which deals okay damage at a great range. This is a pot shot ability at best, and it does that job well. It's not the selling point though. No, the selling point is the attack stats, range 1, attack 4, strength 3, 1, 4 damage. This might not look like much, but that's because it isn't. In fact, it's pretty bad by itself, but then we look at the Tomb Banshee's ability, Frightful Touch. Until the end of the activation, all hits in melee become crits. This is huge, and I mean massive. That 1-4 profile functionally becomes a 4-4 profile, and this skyrockets her damage above the Knight of Shrouds in most cases, and equals that model in worst case scenarios on average. The downside is that this is a triple and it's not unique. This ability appears on a number of other units and needless to say, the Tomb Banshee is not the best unit to take it on. I would go as far as saying the model is solid, it's not too expensive, has some plinky plunk pot shots, and honestly can shred in melee when supported effectively. It's okay, I quite like it. Next up is the Khan Wraith. Or the Ken Wraith. Um, 
and it's another weirdly interesting unit for slightly more than the Tomb Banshee, you get an identical defensive profile. You also get a better offensive profile that gets even better with the benefit of range 2, although you do lose the 10 inch shooting attack. This should make an obvious pick over the Banshee, and honestly it can be. If you plan on never spending dice or boosting your Banshee because it's too expensive, the Khan Wraith is the better choice because it's a solid model in combat just by itself. With Onslaught, it's better than a Knight of Shrouds unbuffed, and it's budget friendly. If, however, you buff the Banshee with Frightful Touch, the Khan Wraith is left in the dirt against all targets. To offset this, the Khan Wraith does have an AoE ability that deals flat dice damage against all enemies within 3 inches called Reaped Like Corn. But this is a quad. Like the Spirit Torment, this ability is simply too unreliable, even if the potential damage output is outstanding. For the record, in all of my test games, I never got this ability to go off, let alone go off with a full whack ideal scenario hit. Make of that what you will. Overall, between the Tomb Banshee and the Khan Wraith, it's honestly a matter of preference. I don't think either will, much, will see much play once we've finished looking at the rest of the heroes, but I do think they're both very solid for their points. Unfortunately, they are somewhat overshadowed by a little bit of redundancy in the Extola of Shaish. This guy is 40 points cheaper than the Khan Wraith, has less wounds, less strength, and no unique ability. But honestly, these guys are a solid leader that can absolutely just fill in your hero slots and do work. They are better value than the Khan Wraiths and will put out more damage per point. And honestly, I just like them. I just don't use them. Why? Because the Dread Warden exists. And speaking of the Dread Warden, that guy is one of the best heroes in Nighthaunt. For $125 redos, you are getting movement 6, toughness 4, and 12 wounds. This is not great for a hero, but it's actually surprisingly on point for a model of this cost. In terms of attacking stats, the Dread Warden is attacks 3, strength 3, 2, 4 damage, which is quite weak on the strength end, but fairly respectable on the actual damage end. So far, so confusing though, why is this Noodle a fantastic hero? Well, that's because he has access to Chilling Horde, a very, very nice double. Basically, when the Dread Warden is near a minion, the Dread Warden can receive plus one strength, plus one attack. This skyrockets the Dread Warden to attacks for strength four, two, four damage, which, if you recall, is identical to the Knight of Shrouds. Only the Dread Warden is 65 points cheaper. The best part, the Dread Warden itself is a minion. This means you can run two Dread Wardens and they can buff each other, giving you a very solid frontline duo for a very competitive price. Not only that, because these are heroes, you still get access to Aura of Dread and more importantly, Spectral Summons. Why is this important? Well, if a Dread Warden dies, your other Dread Warden can summon it back to the field within 3 inches, making them shockingly resilient. I found myself bringing two of these in just about every single list, and I never, ever regretted it. Outstanding, cheap, powerful, and even their ability is easy to spam. Top, top tier, top tier. But that's not all. The Dread Warden might be fantastic, but there is more, and we are talking about the Slasher Crone. And man, the Slasher Crone makes the Khan Wraith and the Tomb Banshee look like crap. This thing is in a league of its own thanks to its ludicrous spike potential and great average damage output for 165 points, which is 10 points cheaper than the Khan Wraith and Banshee, you get movement 6, toughness 4, and 15 wounds, which is, you know, a minus of 3 wounds. Offensively, though, you get attacks 5, strength 3, 2, 4 damage, which is just a lovely number of attacks and perfect for just throwing a bunch of dice and hoping for 6s. On average, the Slasher Crone outdamages both the Banshee and the Wraith 
providing that the Banshee isn't buffed with Frightful Touch. Here's where things get interesting. Frightful Touch is a triple, which is very resource intensive. For a double, the Slasher Crone can use Onslaught, which actually increases the damage per action to be greater than the Banshee's. Not only that, but the Slasher Crone has access to Harrowing Shriek, a very powerful ability that acts like a variable ranged net, preventing enemies from moving and disengaging. The Slasher Crone has great damage potential and utility and outshines most of the hero section. Cheap and very effective. And finally, we get on to our last hero, and that is the Hellwraith. This thing is okay. For 200 points, you get movement 10, toughness 4, 25 wounds. It's really solid. Offensively, you're range 2, attacks 4, strength 3, 1 4 damage with access to Frightful Touch. This basically makes the Hellwraith a much faster, much tougher Tomb Banshee, although it will set you back an extra 25 points. The question is, is it worth it? No, I don't think so. The Slasher Crone is already better than the Banshee and is cheaper, and the Dreadblade Harrow is faster and has a better damage profile and doesn't require buffs to get good. The Hellwraith is fine, I just don't see why I would bring it outside of being flavorful. Like so many units in Nighthorn, it feels redundant, it feels like it's retreading well-worn ground, and this will only continue as we get onto the fighters, and that's what we're going to look at now. We are about halfway through, so strap in, there's more to go. So starting up our fighters, we have the chain ghasts. These guys are a bit weird. These are first and foremost ranged units, with the catch being they aren't very good. Uh, I mean, they're fine. Most ranged units in Warcry are bad, and these guys are on par, if not better, than those bad units. Range 12 is actually excellent and makes them incredibly hard to deal with, especially with movement 6 and fly on their profile. Strength 4 is also very nice, as is 1 4 damage, but all of this really just adds up to doing about 1 damage per action and there are 130 points, making them really, really bad. They have a lot going for them, sure, they've got wounds, they've got toughness, they've got range, but the lack of meaningful damage and a huge price tag makes them a really hard sell. Not only that, the only ability they have access to is Aura of Dread, which they won't get to use because ideally they want to be standing even further back and out of range of Aura of Dread. I would give these guys a miss 100% of the time. With that guy out of the way, we go on to a batch of guys that are basically all the same, so I'm going to rapid fire them as fast as I can to try and save some time and prevent being overly repetitious. Glaive Wraith Stalkers are chaff. They are 90 points, movement 6, toughness 4. They come with 10 wounds and a really basic attack profile that is basically a spear with less crit. Spears tend to crit for around about 4 in my experience. These guys are solid. They're cheap, survivable, deal 2 times the damage of a chain ghast, although they do need to be in combat. Range 2 on their attacks is quite nice. They are great at Range 2 on their attacks is very nice though, and they are great at throwing out Aura of Dread, but they have no bells or whistles since they have no dedicated ability to cult their own. They're solid, but just not very impactful. Not great. And then we have the Grim Gas Reaper, which are basically Glaive Wraith Stalkers, but with slightly better offense, and by slightly I mean like half a pip of damage on average per action. They get reap like corn as their ability like the corn wraith however like that model that ability is not reliable enough to ever factor in however if you were going to use that ability or at least like bank on it maybe coming up the grim wrath reaper is actually a decent bet since they are far cheaper to bring so it makes them easier to splash in your list i don't think they're worth the points they're 15 points more than the aforementioned glaive wraiths and they don't justify that cost at all in my opinion and then we get to the Chain Rasps. These guys are bad, like really, really bad. Their stats are awful and they are only 5 points cheaper than the Glaive Wraith who has more range, more health and also deals more damage. Now these guys do have the Minion Rune Mark which gives them access to Chilling Horde but these pale in comparison to the Dread Warden combo as in Chain Rasps deal half the damage per activation and are not that much cheaper to boot. I would give these guys a skip. There is better chaff and better combo potential elsewhere. 
If you haven't started to get frustrated by redundancy, this one might tip you over the edge. This is another flavour of 10 wound chaff, only this time it's 100 points, has 1 4 damage and a range of 1 and strength of 4. This guy is fine. They are way better than Grim Gas Reapers since they have better damage profiles and are cheaper. They're also noticeably more effective in combat than Glaive Wraiths. Between the two, I think it is a toss up. You could take either for chaff and they'd both be fine. I'll probably lean on the cheapness of Glaive Wraiths, but both work in their intended role. Again, this guy has no dedicated ability, so Aura of Dread is all you can do here, but of course, Aura of Dread is quite good. Finally, we get onto something a little bit more interesting, but still falls into this really redundant category of fighter, and that is the Maya Morn Banshee. This is an okay model, but again, falls into the same camp as every other fighter. They do the same thing with negligible difference. The Maya Morn is a beautiful model though, but it isn't very good. For 20 points more than the Blade Geist, you are not getting much of a damage bump. Sure, minimum damage 2 is nice, and this does make the Maya Morn an okay frontline fighter. It's just too expensive, and again, I'd rather just save the points and get something cheaper, or as we'll look in at a minute, something just better. And again, no unique ability to be seen. This is just another Dread Aura Pumper. So we finally get to something good, and that is the Dread Scythe Harridan. This thing is really nice, and like, I mean really, really nice. 105 points nets you your standard Nighthorned defensive profile. It also nets you 5 attacks, strength 3, 1, 3 damage. This might not seem great, but actually that weight of attacks is really impactful, as in on average this deals around the same damage as a Mayamon Banshee on average for 15 points less. They are slightly more than a Bladegeist, but again the Harridan is just better in combat and has way more spike potential thanks to the sheer weight of attacks. These are basically mini slasher crones, and that's a very good thing. These are really cheap, can be taken in high numbers for a really solid frontline brawler. Not only that, they have access to Harrowing Shriek, which as we've mentioned before, is the Nighthorn's net equivalent, giving them some serious utility, especially when you also have Aura of Dread. Just an all around solid unit, and one that I would take over just about everything else we've discussed up until this point. And coming hot off the heels of the Harridan is the Spirit Host, and your eyes do not deceive you, this thing has 28 wounds. Spirit Hosts are the super upper end of the fight at a Night Haunt, and they are shockingly good at what they do. So, looking at their stats, they have come with 28 wounds which is an immediate draw here, with Toughness 4 and access to Dread Aura, the Spirit Host is very hard to kill and can tie things up wonderfully. Offensively, these are Haridans Plus, as in they have the same profile, just with an extra attack for good measure. This makes them better at fishing for crits, and this pumps their damage up even higher. Now, they are 175 points, which is 65 points more than the Haridan. So are they worth it? Yes, and that's because they also have access to Frightful Touch, which massively increases your damage output. As remember, all of your crit hits become crits. With this buff, the Spirit Host deals a minimum, minimum of two times more damage on average than the Haridan. And against some things, they're dealing up to three times more damage. That is kind of bonkers, and you are looking at something like 6 damage per action against Toughness 1 above. Now this isn't great by any means, but it is one of the best options we have access to in Nighthaunt. Everything combined, the wounds, the damage, the ability, all make the Spirit Host very good on the tabletop, and I try to throw in at least one in every list I ran with Nighthaunt. They are super solid and just stick around and mess people up. I absolutely love these things. And unfortunately, we now just take a bit of a step back. So after, you know, the, the Dread Scythe and the Spirit Host, we now get to the Hex Wraith. And Hex Wraiths are bad. They are 10 points cheaper than the Host. They move faster, but have less wounds, have less attacks, deal less damage, even with their access to Frightful Touch. Like the Hell Wraith, these are very flavorful, very nice models. 
and I can totally see people bringing them in a themed list. I just don't think they're worth their points. They feel very redundant when put alongside the Spirit Host. And finally, we have the Craven Throne Guard. And if you thought that we were done with throwaway crap chaff that all have the same damage profiles, well, Night Haunt have surprised you because the Craven Throne Guard really suck. They are just another brand of ghostly redundancy that doesn't compare at all to the Harridan, and frankly, it doesn't compare to anything else. For 105 points, they are way too expensive for a model that will do very, very little on the board. Absolutely skip them and move on. So overall, the Night Haunt are a real pain to look at, as in I was just pulling my hair out looking through their list. So many of their units are just the same unit, but with slightly worse or slightly better stats. Like, it's a chore looking through this list, and it isn't internally balanced at all. I think there are some clear winners here, and most of this list is simply to get all of the Age of Sigma models into Warcry without really asking the question of why you would take them or what they actually bring to the game. I think this good stuff is so much better than everything else that like two thirds of this, this, this book can be completely ignored and you wouldn't be missing out on anything. But now we've had a look at all the technical stuff and had a little rant there. It's time to finally make a list. It's time to put it all together and make a list that really brings the power of the Night Haunt to bear. So the list here really got me having a lot of fun with Night Haunt after having a lot of irritation planning the list. We have one Dread Blade Harrow, two Dread Wardens, three Dread Scythe Harridans, and a Spirit Host. You have speed and utility of the Dread Blade, you have the value and power of the self-buffing Dread Wardens, and the sheer quantity of attacks coming from the Harridans and the Spirit Host. This list does work, and since you have three heroes on the board, you can resurrect really effectively. It's hard for enemies to shut you down when you have so many high quality units that just keep on coming back over and over again when they eventually get cut down. You can scrap, you can play objectives, there's nothing not to like here. Now, I don't normally talk about thralls, but I wanted to put in some honourable mentions because, you know, I should probably start talking about thralls more often. Uh, the Night Haunt have access to two, and these are the Direwolves and the Felbats, and both are very, very good. Um, the Bat is probably the worst of the two, but the Bat gives you high movement and easy access to T4 damage, as well as having a very, very strong triple that actually puts the damage output on par with the very best this faction has to offer. They are expensive at 130 points, but I like them an awful lot, and you could absolutely make lists with them as high speed nukes. And direwolves? Direwolves are excellent and another reason why the chaff in Night Haunt absolutely suck. For 85 points you get movement 8, toughness 3 and 10 wounds. This guy is fast, if a little bit squishy because of that low toughness. Attacks wise you're getting 3 attacks, strength 3, 1 3 damage and that is really solid for a model of this cost and on par with all of your native chaff. Where the direwolf really shines is in its reaction and ability. Necromantic Bonds lets you react when your enemies move near your heroes and they get a free move and a free attack when they react with this. Which is frankly excellent. And again, of course, the bats can also use this reaction as well, but besides the point. The wolves' unique ability, Slavering Charge, is also pretty darn spicy as it lets them move 6 inches for a double so long as there is an enemy in that range. That's fantastic and lets you get around the board into combat and generally be a pain in the bum. Direwolves are fast, cheap and effective. They outshine every other chaff unit in Nighthaunt to the point I simply wouldn't bother taking them. I just take more direwolves. But that's all I have for you today. If you made it this far, thank you. You are truly awesome. This video was very hard to make. It took a long time and multiple script rewrites to get it to hopefully flow smoothly. Let me know in the comments what you thought and if you would like to see more Compendium Factions covered. Please remember to also leave a like and hit that subscribe button too. It really helps the channel out and lets me know that you want to see more content like this. Anyway, until next time, I'll catch you all later. Ta-ra!